This is Chemistry 302, lecture number 16 on polyprotic acids. Well, we finally arrived at the last lecture to be given on acid-base chemistry. We've spent weeks, literally, delving into what's going on behind the scenes, underneath the solution, at equilibrium, in the bottom of the beaker, what is taking place in there, what are the concentrations of acids and bases in solution. And we've looked at a variety of different ways using the Rice expression to allow us to do some pretty sophisticated work. I mean, just think about it. Not only have we learned how to do strong and weak acid calculations, buffer calculations, neutralization um, calculations, we've even learned that there are approximations, assumptions that we make that simplify our math, and we've learned how to work problems if we decide not to simplify, if we want to do a robust engineering-like solution. So I think more than any other subject that we've looked at in this course, acid-base chemistry is the place where we've put so much of our effort. On a certain level, we do that because it is an enormously profound concept, the idea of figuring out the pH of a water solution, since water is everywhere. But the other reason that we do it is because it's really intellectually gratifying to really fundamentally understand, at its essence, what's taking place in solution. And yet, I've got one more example to present to you. And the reason I've got one more example to present to you of a lecture on acid-base chemistry is that unless we appreciate what most acids and bases look like, then you're not going to have a full understanding of how to apply these concepts of acid-base chemistry almost immediately once you walk into the laboratory. The truth is that up until this point, everything I've shown you for the most part, actually with just one exception, has a single great big giant H sitting on it, but it's just one H. HCl, HClO4, HNO3, CH3, COOH, HNH3. There has only been one acidic proton on any of the compounds we've looked at. There's only been one equilibrium expression describing the loss of a proton from HCl, the loss of a proton from ammonium ion, the loss of a proton from acetic acid. There's been a single Ka value. Ka equals a single H plus times its anion over the weak acid or over the strong acid. But you know what? Even though I was able to derive all of the Ka expressions for this for strong, weak, and buffer, the truth of the matter is I derive them knowing that there are a relatively limited number of these single proton species, species we call monoprotic, one proton. Most of the world is, in fact, polyprotic. By that I mean there is at least two or more protons or hydroxides sitting on a compound there's more than one acidic or basic site in a compound. You can imagine when you look at a protein with all of those different millions of sites sitting on there where the possibility for a proton to reside might be that there's going to be more than just a single monoprotic acid calculation to do, more than just a single Ka value. Sure enough, whether I'm looking at the two hydroxides in barium or the two protons in sulfuric acid, or the two protons in carbonic acid, or the two protons in this dicarboxylic acid, one there or there, or, oh, check this out. This is an amino acid, an amino acid. Do you know how prevalent amino acids are? Here's an amino acid-like compound. It's got a carboxylic acid on this end, and it has a protonated basic site over there. That's two protons there, not one, two. Or take a look at this. There's phosphoric acid. It's got three protons on it. Or look at this compound right here. Do you see that hydrogen hanging off of there? That's a basic residue, that NH2 group. See that COOH? That's an acidic residue. Even that um, alcohol right there hanging off the phenyl group has acid-base characteristic. That means, then, that as I start to make larger and larger organic molecules, I'm seeing more and more protons and basic residue sites I have to deal with. Heck, here's one of the most famous of them. This right here is a tetraprotic acid, of all things. It's got two carboxylic acids sitting off of it. 
It's got two carboxylic acids sitting off of it, but it's even worse than that. There is a nitrogen group that could pick up a proton because it's a base. There is a nitrogen group that can pick up a proton because it's base. This is actually a compound, tetraacetic ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid, EDTA. This right here has six sites that can be protonated, two over here, two over there, and two here in the middle. This compound, EDTA, how common is it? Well, how about this? There isn't a kind of junk food in the world you eat that doesn't have this stuff rammed down its throat so that when it sits in a candy machine somewhere waiting for you to eat it, that it doesn't keep it from rotting. So these polyprotic acid cases here are incredibly prevalent. They're far more likely to exist in nature, far more likely to exist in our bodies, far more likely to exist in our in waterways than monoprotic systems, and I need to be able to talk about and explain them.